what is the cosine of the cosine of the cosine of the cosine of the cosine and so on of some particular variable x? This kind of funny puzzle actually leads to some kind of interesting mathematics. So well, let's see if we can figure it out. Now, the first thing I want to do is to reframe what I mean by the cosine of the cosine of the cosine and so forth. And the way I'm going to do this, is I'm going to imagine that I start at some spot x1. x1 is just a number like, I don't know, a million or e or whatever you like. Then, what I'm going to do is create an x2 by saying it's just cosine of the x1. And more generally, I'll say that an xn is the cosine of xn minus 1. What I've done here is I've reframed this as a sequence. You start at an x1, then you have this sequence of terms. You're always taking one cosine and then two cosines and three cosines and so forth. And so the question then is, what is the limit of that sequence? Does this converge to a number? If it does converge to a number, does it depend on where you start? Does it depend on the value of x1? Now, if you've watched my sort of calculus playlist, you might not actually have seen a sequence that looks anything quite like this. So what I really want to do first is just get my hands dirty and start playing around. And the first thing I observe is this. Here's just a graph of cosine. And imagine I put in any input that you like, like say a million. Well, cosine of any value is something that's actually just between the values of minus 1 and 1. So one application of cosine takes it from any possible input now to an output just between minus 1 and 1. And then let's try to take cosine again. So now we're taking cosine of numbers between minus 1 and 1. Well, the biggest height of this is the value of 1, and the smallest is going to be cosine of 1, or cosine of minus 1, which is the same thing. So you take another cosine and it actually shrinks the interval to this smaller interval between cosine of 1 and 1. So we already start to get this flavor that you start with the entire real numbers and then you apply cosine once the interval gets smaller, you apply cosine a second time and the interval gets smaller again. This gives us some hope that maybe it will indeed converge, but let's keep going along. So given this, I'm going to focus just on the region between 0 and pi over 2, and let me just start anywhere, like how about over here? This is a number like maybe 0 0.3. So if I started at this value, then the height of this is cosine of that value, and that's going to be the input for the next term in my sequence. That is, the output becomes the input, and so the x2, the next location, the cosine of the x1, looks, well, it looks over here. Okay, so then let's try to figure out what the cosine of x2 is. I get some height, and that height is going to be the input of the x3, the cosine of the cosine of x1. Again, I get another height, another height, and another height. So what I'm noticing is this sort of alternating behavior, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, they're shrinking down together, at least that's what it appears to be like for the few spots that I've plotted. Now, this is all fine, but often when I'm problem solving, I like to think, is there a shift in perspective that lets me understand why it has this alternating behavior a little bit better, not just relying on the computer to graph it for me. So let's actually go back to the first one again, just this, the single x1 here, and try to understand what's going to happen. The big idea of the sequence is that you're always taking cosine of the cosine of the cosine of the cosine of wherever you were before. So in other words, the output becomes the input to the next cosine. And if I'm trying to imagine an output becomes an input, what's useful is for me to actually plot the line y equal to x. And the idea here is I want to think of the output, like the, the height of the cosine of that very first spot. It's going to become the input to the next term in the sequence, which is equivalent to saying that the y and the x are going to be interchanged. And so what I can do here is I can draw this sort of horizontal line from wherever height I am at on the cosine curve over to the line y equal to x, and now I know the input value for the next term. And then I drop this vertical down to the curve again, down to the cosine. This is how I'm visually representing the idea that the output of taking the first cosine becomes the input for taking the next. I go over to line y equal to x and then back down to the curve. Okay, so let's run this one more time. Let's take the output of my new location and make it the input of the next one. So that means I need to go back to the left to get to the y equal to x curve. The idea here is that the height, the, the cosine of the x2, is now smaller than the intersection with the line y equal to x, and, and so that means where it's going to go is off to the left. All right, back up to the curve to figure out where I should be, and I start getting this spiral. 
So this behavior is gonna be go over to line y equal to x, back down to the curve. Go over to line y equal to x, back up to the curve. And it keeps spiraling around in this kind of manner. And now the visual is perhaps a little bit clearer. This spiral is gonna keep on spiraling closer and closer and closer until it starts to converge, or at least it looks that way, to the spot where cosine of x intersects the line y equal to x. In other words, the spot where cosine of x is equal to x. What's remarkable about this is that the spot that you end up where cosine of x is equal to x is actually independent of where you start. You could start at the 0.3, like I programmed into the computer, or you could start at a million, you could start at pi, you could start anywhere you wish. The spiral is gonna look a little bit different, but it's always gonna have this behavior of going back and forth over this line y equal to x, and so it's going to converge to the spot where cosine of x is equal to x. And, and what is that spot? Well, cosine of x equal to x can be approximated as about 0 0.739, it's, it's just a number. Now, this equation is a so-called transcendental equation. And this value, which we've approximated here of 0.739, it doesn't have some other name, like some other constants we like, like root two or pi or e, but that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. If this was common enough, we could have given it a name like root two or pi or e, how those all have special names. But take, for example, root two, which is just the solution to the equation x squared equal to two, or one of the solutions to that equation. It's important enough that we come up with its own symbol for it and we call it root two. This is the same code of idea. There's a value here, which we can approximate, perhaps using some series, but we don't have a special name for it. Nevertheless, the solution to it is 0 0.739. Now, you might be thinking that I'm just largely just convincing you by trying to show you the pretty picture, and I am, but there is actually an important theorem that underlines this. So to state the theorem, we need just two little pieces. The first thing is the idea of a function, in this case the function cosine, being a contraction. And the idea is that if you start with two points, say x and y, and you figure out what the distance is between them, after you apply the function, in this case cosine, the two points become closer together. I'll leave it as an exercise for you. You could put it down in the comments to prove by some little trig identities that cosine does indeed have this behavior, but it does. When you take cosine of two points, they get closer than where they started. We've seen this visually already, like if I imagine taking all real numbers and then I apply cosine, it just shrinks down to the minus one to one. I apply cosine again, it's just that cos of one to one as we saw earlier. So the point is that the, the distances between the bounds on these intervals are getting smaller. It is a contraction. And then if you have a function that is a contraction on say, the real numbers to the real numbers, then we have an incredibly powerful theorem, the Banach fixed point theorem. It says this, if you have a contraction, then there is a unique fixed point. A fixed point is a spot, I'm calling it x star here, where when you take f of the x star, you just get back to itself. Those of you who have seen my videos on topology will have seen multiple different fixed point theorems, but here we have one that's applying to functions of this nature. And it's a spot where f of x is just itself. The theorem actually says even more when you sort of delve into how to prove it, it says that if you take this sequence, like we did, where xn is just the function of the previous one, you construct that sequence out, then the fixed point is the limit of that sequence. And so this theorem is the proof that the methodology works the way I sort of articulated in this video. But indeed, the visual intuition, I hope, is clear. Now, this is the first video of 2022 for me, and so I did want to close out with a massive thank you to all of my members who have been around and supporting me throughout 2021 and before. Honestly, you all are amazing and are a huge part of how I'm able to keep on doing this channel, so thank you very much for that. With that said, give the video a like for the YouTube algorithm, and we'll do some more math in the next video.